Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the A Coding Journey from Classroom to Career. This webinar is co-organized by the STEM Alliance, Scientix, and OneStream. My name is Luigi Brisco, and I work at European Schoolnet as a project support coordinator for the STEM Alliance. And together with us today in the room, we have my colleagues, Rocio Benito and Camilla Zonta, who will supporting uh, this webinar from a technical point of view. If you have any issues uh, with your audio or connection, please do not hesitate to send us a message in the chat. Before going through the agenda today, let me share some te uh, technical uh, details. So you will uh, see that your microphones and cameras have been disabled. So if you have a question for our speaker, you can just post them in the chat. We will also be sharing useful uh, information and links with you uh, throughout the webinar in the chat. Um, we will share the signature list um, and, um, and later uh, we will give the floor to a speaker. The objective uh, of this webinar is to highlight the benefits uh, for, uh, of coding for children and to raise awareness about the importance of coding in order to spark uh, students' interest in STEM, uh, in STEM uh, careers and STEM field. Uh, and finally, you will be able to ask questions throughout uh, the webinar and we will address them uh, in the QA session in the last part of the, of the webinar. So um, this is the signature list uh, in the chat, but also clicking here on the slide. Um, you can uh, you can um, uh, validate your participation uh, and your attendance uh, of the webinar. This is to prove that the event took place so that we can continue to organize events like this in the future. And also, if you are interested uh, in a certificate of particip uh, participation, this is the only way to request one. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Matt Karslake, our speaker uh, for, uh, for today's webinar. Uh, Matt is the lead technical education consultant at OneStream. He has worked in STEM-related industry for over 20 years, focusing on the promotion of non-STEM-related career opportunities in STEM businesses. Matt, thank you so much for being here with us, and um, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Luigi. Okay, just going to take control here of where we're at in the presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this session. Really pleased to have you on board, and it's been fantastic to see all of the people joining and telling me the countries that you're coming from. Uh, all those people from Greece, wonderful. I'm going to Crete for my summer holidays this year, so I'm looking forward to seeing your wonderful country again. So what we've got today, we're, um, as Luigi said, it's a coding journey from classroom to career. And uh, just let me give you a little bit more background about myself. Uh, as Luigi said, I've been working with uh, STEM for about 20 years, uh, but I've only been with OneStream Software for just over four years. And I originally joined them as a software trainer and then recently moved over to, well, recently, two years ago, moved over to the department which actually creates the training content for the uh, for the trainers to deliver. And that's working for what we call our product management division. So this is the part of the company which actually creates the software that we sell. It's financial consolidation software, which might not sound very interesting straight away, but for me, it is. I am a self-confessed uh, nerd. Sorry to yeah. jump in, Mark. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're moving the slides, but... Um... No, not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I am a self-confessed nerd and being part of the, the product management team just means that I'm accessing the people who are heavily involved with coding. Um, and so that was really why I wanted to volunteer to come along and, uh, and run the presentation for you today. So with that, what we're moving into today with this coding journey, there's quite a bit to, to walk you through with this story of working with an organization called Code Monkey. And I'm going to give you the, the background to this project, why we were thinking about even working with Code Monkey in the first place. I'll talk you through what the original objective was, uh, what the learning objective was, what we wanted to achieve commercially, as well as for the, um, the, the students that would benefit from this. 
And then obviously I want to talk about the STEM benefits that come from this project anyway. Um, so you can hopefully align those two ideas that you have in your own schools and classrooms. But then I also wanted to move on to what the proposal was about, because prior to starting this relationship with CodeMonkey, I'd never put a, a proposal like this together before. And, you know, OneStream software, we're just over 10 years old, but we're worth six billion dollars. And trying to put a proposal together for the executive team of that organization, I was nervous. I'll admit that one, but I'll, I'll talk you through the background of that proposal and what we pulled together. And um, then I'll walk you through the timeline. So, I mean, I've been with OneStream, like I say, for just over four years, but we started this journey with CodeMonkey about two years ago. So there's been a, a lot involved in the lead up to it and um, in it, uh, the whole project going live. So I'll talk you through the timeline. I'll walk you through how CodeMonkey engaged with all the schools and the teachers that we worked with, because I think for you, it's important to understand the benefit of their resource um, and not getting any um, uh, any promotional material from CodeMonkey, by the way, for this. This is just my opinion on the relationship with uh, with CodeMonkey and this project. And then I'll go through the progress that we've had to date. And then as with any decent presentation, we should be finishing it off thinking about what did we learn? What did we take away from this whole CodeMonkey project? So the, um, the background, I'll, I'll forward the slide in a moment, but uh, it's important for you to be aware, I think, this was just um, an idea that came around from the table between myself and a lady called Nicola O'Connor. And she'd seen CodeMonkey online um, as an online resource, and she thought it would be just a good idea to bring to the table. And well, why did we bring it to the table? Well, what we've got within OneStream is uh, a movement called the uh, diversity and inclusion strategy, diversity, equity and inclusion. So this whole movement started um, about three years ago and I decided to volunteer to help out with it um, because I was interested to celebrate diversity in our workplace, to celebrate inclusion. Um, and the way that it was organized was roughly six different subcommittees. And these committees were all about trying to improve diversity, equity and inclusion within OneStream software from a perspective of marketing, for example. So we will be thinking about the ways we can be more diverse in our approach with marketing using different voices and different accents from the different cultures that we have from the people that work with OneStream to to show the world how diverse our internal culture is. Um, we wanted to make sure that our internal learning objectives were as diverse as they could be. But there was one particular group in that that really interested me, and that was the community engagement group. And as Luigi said, I've, I've worked with uh, STEM for about 20 years, and I, I like working with my community. I help out with my son's field hockey team. I've helped out uh, a total of about 10 years in my local primary school with their parent teacher association. I like to give back to the community where I can. So I had an affinity with this group and I ended up chairing and, and leading that group as it turns out. But what we've got on the screen here is their, uh, their original objective, which I didn't set. This was put in place before I started. So they wanted to share the one stream experience with younger generations through partnerships with outside programs and internal opportunities that provide practical improvement in social mobility and STEM areas for young people globally. So there's a few things in that statement that really caught my attention. Obviously, STEM was the, the important one for me because I like to promote STEM in the UK. The social mobility. Uh, well, giving opportunities to people who might not normally have those afforded to them. I like the sound of that. And the global aspect as well. I'm based in the UK, but OneStream Software is an American company. And so I thought, well, how can I affect change globally? And so, like I say, I ended up uh, chairing this group and uh, throwing around many ideas uh, and projects that we worked on to try and, uh, and work with those objectives. But the, uh, the final reason why this kind of project background really appealed to me was because we do have an industry skills shortage. And although this presentation is really about coding, at OneStream Software, it's so much more than just coding. There are so many more different careers that come part of us being a STEM organization. We've got marketing teams, we've got human resources teams, we've got sales, we've got the administrative systems, uh, we've got product management, as I've uh, talked to you about already. Um, but we do fundamentally have 
a general skill shortage of people coming into the IT industry. And so, again, I was thinking, well, what can I do to try and encourage people to be interested in not just our industry, but also OneStream software as a whole? So this was really the the springboard that, uh, that, that, that got my interest in, and wanted me to work closely with this community engagement group. And then Nicola O'Connor, the other lady I was working with, she uh, she just brought CodeMonkey to the table one day. She'd seen it online. In fact, her, her children had, uh, had played with it. And it's an online coding resource. Um, I'll show you some screenshots of it later on, but it's it's very much about gamification. It's about introducing children between the ages of five to 14 to the world of coding. So they'll give them a starting point, um, some exercises and games they'll engage with, which will um, give them certain tasks to complete. And then as they progress through that, they'll then move on to a slightly more challenging uh, game and at the next level. And I'll, I'll talk you through those levels later on. Uh, but they didn't need to have any prior coding experience. They just go to the, yeah, the, code monkey, uh, the code monkey platform and start engaging from there. And the statistics that I've got on the screen here, these are actually two years old. So at that point, CodeMonkey, they're based in California in the US, but they, they work globally. And as you can see, they had engaged with 10 million children globally, more than 50 million different CodeMonkey levels completed. So what that's saying is that those 10 million children have gone through five different levels of the CodeMonkey platform to improve their understanding of coding. But what was also really interesting to me and another uh, contributing reason as to why I wanted to talk to CodeMonkey was the fact that they were supported by 75,000 teachers. That's not a small number. And that's not teachers supporting CodeMonkey. That's actually the other way around. It's CodeMonkey working closely with the teachers to make sure they knew how to engage with the platform and how to encourage their students to get the most out of the experience. So this was really just about CodeMonkey coming to the table. So what was the uh, what was the objective we were working towards with this? Well, we were trying to think about, you know, why should we even bother approaching CodeMonkey? The, the platform's out there already. How much difference can we really make? And we looked at it and thought, well, we need to provide some kind of unique reason to be able to go back to the board of OneStream software and say, we should do this. And so we thought, well, OK, we're we're a successful organization. How do we make coding available to those that are perhaps less um, less able to access these resources? So we thought, OK, let's try and target um, underprivileged children and get them into the world of coding. We wanted to make sure that teachers were supported. As I said a moment ago, that was really important to me because teachers jobs are hard enough. You work enough hours. Um, you need, if there's going to be more resources available to you, you need to get that with the right level of support. And then what we thought, well, CodeMonkey, it's for ages five to 14. This was unusual for us because normally when we're promoting STEM, we're doing that with students who are 14 and above. We'd never worked with this age group before, but we thought, why don't we try and work with or, or benefit that age group, which then means they can get transferable skills that they could use at some point in the future, hopefully knocking on the door of OneStream software and saying, I've got coding skills. Can I have a career with OneStream? But we thought, let's get these transferable skills walk, uh, working all the way through the primary school system into the high school system and maybe further. Um, and like I say, the, the focus on the alternative age group was key for us because predominantly when I go and do uh, mock interviews at schools or I'm doing careers presentations or careers speed networking, that's typically within kind of 16, 17, 18 year old age group. I've never really promoted STEM on a five to 14 year age group before. So this presented us with a great opportunity to uh, to expose coding to a completely different age group. And so then what were the STEM benefits that we wanted to bring about from all of this? <clears throat> well, uh, the logo that you see on the screen here is one that we use in the UK for STEM learning. Um, obviously, the main benefit of this was the fact that we could promote STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths to, to uh, young people, not just in the UK, but also globally. And as I said a moment ago, it was important to the team at one stream that we're working with CodeMonkey that we could really influence the potential for STEM careers in young people, get them thinking about coding and STEM um, 
from as young as five and then hopefully uh, take that through to um, uh, to their career in the future. But we also wanted to improve this coding confidence. We like that about the CodeMonkey platform because it took them through various levels. It built up their confidence as they were going through. The children get a sense of achievement because they're able to progress through the levels. And we all know we get a, we get a buzz. There's a chemical that's released when we achieve. Um, so walking them through uh, those different um, those different segments and challenges was was going to be good. And so benefiting underprivileged children as well, that was really important to us from a, a STEM benefit uh, perspective. The STEM experiences I engage with at the moment, it's a wide range of children um, from different walks of life. Some are underprivileged, some are more privileged than others, but we just wanted to be able to focus purely on an underprivileged, uh, an unpriv underprivileged group which we then hoped would give them more social mobility. I mean, the, the, um, the community engagement committee that I was that I was chairing, CodeMonkey wasn't the only project. We were working with other organizations in the US who were very much about focusing opportunity being provided to people who wouldn't normally get it. You know, those living in disadvantaged areas that wouldn't normally get exposed to a world of coding, wouldn't normally get the ability to code because they didn't have personal funding to access lessons uh, and support. So we, we wanted to provide that social mobility to enable people to get out of those deprived areas and get, um, get opportunities to, to improve themselves. Now, the last four points on here aren't particularly STEM benefits, but they were important to us because we saw with CodeMonkey that we could scale this project. We were going to go to the board of OneStream Software and ask for some money, and we wanted to kind of see how that would work out. Could we then look to work with more students in the future? But what we also needed to make sure we could provide was real data back to the OneStream executive board to prove that their funding was actually going to be making a difference. And I'll, I'll show you how that's uh, that's worked out in a little while. And the last two points, uh, yeah, there have been opportunities to promote OneStream as a brand. Um, yes, we do want to benefit children from underprivileged areas and improve people's access to coding, but we are a commercial enterprise. We did want to have some opportunities to be able to show off why we're we're putting this money into uh, into this kind of uh, into this kind of project? So we had internal marketing opportunities to tell one streamers about what's going on. You know, we're a global organization with about twelve hundred employees, and it's fantastic to be able to tell all of those people about the, this work that's going on, about these children that we're benefiting through the um, the Code Monkey project. And then we had external marketing opportunities with LinkedIn as well, just to, again, shout about it. But it's not just shouting about one stream, it's shouting about CodeMonkey and getting awareness of that platform out there. I am sitting here right now wondering how many people have Googled CodeMonkey already. Um, just hang on until the presentation is finished before you carry on with that one. But I, uh, I would uh, recommend that you do so afterwards. So those are the main uh, thing, the main STEM benefits that were uh, that were coming out of this. So the proposal. Well, this was something that Nicola and myself had never put together before. We'd never put a proposal to a board of a six billion dollar corporation um, to uh, to try and encourage them to want to spend money uh, on a project that they knew nothing about. However, what we did have on our side was that the CEO, our current CEO, he's he is a coder. He wrote a lot of the code that goes into the OneStream software platform. So he's absolutely passionate about, um, about coding generally. And so we needed an angle for approval. So we had to put together a proposal that focused on the main features and benefits for OneStream software as a whole. You know, how it could benefit us from a marketing perspective, how we could try and encourage more people to come into the coding arena to be interested in STEM careers. Um, we wanted an angle that we were aiming at underprivileged children. Um, again, just trying to find as many areas as possible or ways as possible that we could try and influence the board to say yes to our funding proposal. And because we're a global organization and CodeMonkey operates globally, we thought, well, hang on, let's tie some global aspect into this. We had no idea how many people to, to try and get funding for. And so we picked a number, which is what you can see on the screen, 5,000. Just picked up out of the blue. We had no idea whether they would approve funding for it. Uh, so we just kind of went back to CodeMonkey 
with that number and said, OK, how much is it going to cost for us to benefit 5000 students globally? And CodeMonkey came back with thirty seven and a half thousand dollars. That's the price of a decent family car. And throughout this entire project, me and the other people in one stream that are working on this code monkey project we always looked at this as if it was our own money thinking how would we spend this what decisions should go behind how we spend it and ultimately whether we should spend it it's a lot of money despite us being worth what we are as an organization it's still a lot of money to be putting out there and so when code monkey came back with this uh, this quote for thirty seven and a half thousand dollars we thought wow okay um, so how then do we split that globally? Um, because like I've said, we're a, a US based company, but I'm based in the UK. So what we decided to do uh, at the time, we had a relatively new office that had opened up in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. <laughs> and um, our main head office is not far from Detroit in Michigan, which is in the north of the US. Um, so we thought, OK, let's let's go with trying to benefit children in those hubs. But then our European headquarters are based in Manchester. So now we've got Manchester, Atlanta and Detroit. And so we thought, OK, let's split that 5000 between those three hubs. So we were going to try and benefit roughly 2000 students in Detroit, 2000 in Atlanta and 1000 in Manchester and share that money out as we moved on. And um, we succeeded in that one, um, I think. Um, I'll talk you through the engagement strategy in a moment and, uh, and explain just exactly how that all played out. But let's look at the timeline. Earlier on in the presentation, I explained that we actually started this journey with one story um, with one stream in CodeMonkey about two years ago. And this is what I'm talking about here. It was back in March 2021 uh, when Nicola and I were having a conversation as part of the diversity, equity and inclusion strategy. She put it on the table. We started exploring the idea. And then uh, it was in the April when Nicola and I pulled together the proposal for the one stream board, highlighting all of the main features and, and benefits for anybody that would take part. And then we submitted that to the board, which went into a bit of a black hole for a few months, to be honest. Now, what normally happens with one stream software is that in January we find out whether budgets had been approved. But we got some good news in the November of 2021 telling us that the full thirty seven and a half thousand dollars had been approved by the board of one stream software. And <laughs> you can imagine uh, how excited we were to find out that kind of news. It was just incredible um, that a group of people would put faith in our proposal, mm -hmm. in the passion that we had sitting behind this whole project to want to benefit the children in the way uh, in the way that we saw to, to try and understand our vision. So we went through towards the end of 21, moving into 2022, and uh, it was in January when we notified the CodeMonkey that we'd got the, the budget secured. So we signed the contracts with CodeMonkey for this agreed uh, $37,500 for 5,000 students. And then that's really where CodeMonkey started to go to work. And they produced this grant framework, which they launched on their website. And it was a grant framework whereby um, uh, schools and teachers in America could access one part of their website to apply for the grant funding because that's how we labeled it. We weren't really sure initially how to um, enable the students to to get this money over to them. So we, they decided on this grant framework um, that a school would apply to. And then we can ultimately look at that um, that list of applicants and we would decide who was going to benefit. So they created a grant framework for the US and one for the UK. And so by this point, we, uh, Nicola and myself, that is, and the rest of the Code Monkey team at OneStream, we wanted to celebrate all of this. And our organization has uh, company wide meetings, usually every quarter. And then so in April was the next quarterly meeting. And so at that time, we were about 800 employees, I think. And um, I was presenting on that meeting. So I was presenting to all those attendees talking about the code monkey project and the reception that we got was just phenomenal the comments that we got in the chat about it everybody the culture at one stream is very much about celebrating everybody's success so i kind of knew that everybody would be behind it but then then a really unusual thing happened the um the ceo of the company his picture 
just pops up on the side of the chat in the middle of the meeting. I'd finished doing my presentation. I'd finished talking about how wonderful this project was going to be. And then Tom's photo comes up and, uh, you know, I, I never met the guy personally before, never spoke to him before. And he just came on and he said, Matt, that was a brilliant presentation. And he said, uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful that you're promoting coding as a whole. And he said, I think it's so wonderful. He said, I'm going to put my hand in my own pocket and uh, give you, donate another $37,500 of my own money to this project. And quite frankly, we were just floored by that point. Uh, after that, there were other senior executives from OneStream Software that came forward and uh, and wanted to donate uh, further money into it as well. And that was, it was just wonderful to, to see and hear the passion from our executives to support this initiative. But it was clear that it wasn't just about promotion of OneStream at all. They were actively engaging and wanting to promote coding with children in schools. The underprivileged thing didn't even come into it at that point. They just wanted to make sure that coding was being promoted in schools. So we kind of took that away and thought, wow, what do we do with this? We've got another family car to buy. <laughs> you know, how do we how do we make that decision? Um, so anyway, so we move forward uh, to the next month. I'll tell you what happened to that money in a little while. We uh, move forward into May. And by this point, we've, um, we're opening up to schools for them to go to the CodeMonkey website and apply for the funding. And then it was in June where we had a list of all of these schools that, that uh, applied for it and they had to uh, agree to certain criteria in order to get the funding. They had to promise, although this wasn't contractual, they had to promise to, to try and bring coding into the curriculum. And I know teachers have got enough on their plate and enough calls on their time for us to be then asking you to promise to uh, to teach coding um but we wanted teachers to buy into the grant funding we didn't just want to hand out the money and say well there you go you might want to choose to use it we wanted buy in from the teachers so that you would use it you would benefit the children you would engage them with coding exercises so we went through the list and we chose the schools in manchester atlanta and detroit that were going to receive the funding and then after that, of course, we're coming into the summer break. And uh, this was the challenge point for CodeMonkey because they actively put on training sessions and support for teachers that are using CodeMonkey in the classroom. And the only time, of course, we could put those training sessions on prior to the new term starting in September was July and August. So we're trying to pin down teachers in July and August at what is, well, July, as you all know, is an extremely busy time of the year. August, um, well, you're all on holiday. So that was difficult to uh, to pin everybody down. Um, and when I say you're on holiday, I do know that you all do schoolwork during the holidays. I know teachers never really stop. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the training sessions were on for teachers during those times with a view to it all rolling out in September. And at that point, we wanted to see this gradual buildup of numbers for the new academic year. So really how did that actually happen? You know, what did CodeMonkey do as part of this engagement strategy? Well, all of this, all of this lead up. So remember on the timeline, they found out about the contract in January. By March, they'd created this grant funding, um, but they also had the framework in place, the, the knowledge as well about existing schools globally um, and you know, email lists of teachers and so on that they could approach in these agreed catchment areas. So they started to, to research the schools that we should approach and they started contacting them directly because they already had an open relationship with many schools already. And so they went through the process of identifying those schools that um, initially we thought should benefit. And then they proactively um, uh, contacted those schools and teachers to, to say, well, look, this grant funding is available on the website. Go and click on this link and, and see where it goes. Um, so, like I say, they, they created this, this application part of the website that the teachers could go on to. And then they provided this training throughout June and July for the teachers to make sure that they could and get, help the, the students and the children engage properly with the CodeMonkey platform, but also to make sure that the teachers were comfortable in how they should engage with the platform to make sure that, that they had enough support. And, you know, we weren't expecting teachers to understand coding at all. We just wanted to make sure that teachers understood that they were supported to help the students, um, you know, figure out and learn about coding. 
So they provided this platform and the curriculum and support to all of the users. They even launched webinars as well to promote the partnership. So these were uh, launched on LinkedIn. You can follow CodeMonkey on LinkedIn uh, if you wish. Um, so they were doing webinars to, to support what CodeMonkey was all about and the different levels that the students could go through. And then for us, what we were interested in from a one stream perspective was the statistics and data on the student's impact because uh, myself and Nicola realized we had to go back to the one stream board at some point and say, this is what we're getting for the money that you have so generously decided to invest. So where did the progress go? Well, we have monthly calls with CodeMonkey and uh, there were some people that jumped onto the platform in August of 2022, but it was really by September, the official launch, when we started to see the numbers gradually build up. And remember, we were targeting 5,000 students to benefit from access to the CodeMonkey platform. So by the time we uh, were meeting with CodeMonkey each month, we're seeing this gradual increase, and you'll see the actual figures on the next slide. But by the time we got to March, we were looking at 2,529 students had actively engaged with different CodeMonkey levels on the platform. So about halfway towards our 5,000, but we kind of saw that that projection, that was okay, we, we were happy with that. And here you can see how the numbers kind of built up, you know, some that had jumped on early in, in August because they'd gone back to school prior to others in September. You can see how it slowly built up. We can see how things kind of level off a little bit around November, December and January because <laughs> December is another busy time for teachers. It's that festive period. People are trying to get back into the swing of things again back in the new year. So November, December, January, a little bit flat and then things start to pick up again coming up to uh, up to March. But ultimately, even though only half of the people had actively engaged with one stream by March, based on our target of 5,000, now CodeMonkey had actually uh, granted access to 5,200 students. So what we're saying there is that CodeMonkey was ready to work with 5,200 students. So more than we'd originally funded, which we thought was generous of CodeMonkey, we were happy with that one. Um, but it was just half of them that were actively engaging, and that's what we wanted to see increase over time. Now, the uh, the chart that you can see on the bottom left hand corner of the screen there, you can see in the main people were engaging with CodeMonkey Junior as a starting point. And then once they completed that platform, they would progress on to another level, which was perhaps a little bit harder. And some of the uh, stuff they were progressing to was actually Python based classes. Now, I, I'm not a coder. Um, I'm a software trainer. That's what that's what I produce. Um, but even I know that Python is a relatively complex language. And to see the feedback that we've got students between the ages of five to 14 that are progressing to working with a Python based coding language, I just thought was really uh, it was super impressive. And here, so you, you're looking at the kind of um, platforms that uh, that we're working with uh, with CodeMonkey, and these are screenshots of some of their their live games that they use. So you can see it's it's appealing to kids between five and fourteen. The gamification as uh, aspect of it is fun. Um, it's clear and easy to read the coding that's been entered on there, and they encourage them to progress through the different levels. So really, the progress from here for us was just really to communicate with CodeMonkey each month and find out how the uh, how the engagement was going. So progress in uh, 2023. What we've done, it's um it's gone well. Uh, I'm just trying to see if this will actually let me. There we go. May engagement figures. So this is where we're up to as of this month. So we've still not quite reached our 5,000 figure, but we're hoping that by the end of this academic year, we'll we'll reach that 5,000 point. I'm hopeful of that. Not confident, but hopeful. And uh, the reason I'm not confident, I'll explain that when we come up to uh, the um, the learning points in a moment. So by May, just shy of 4,000 people. But actually, the the next step that's come along here is we've decided that we're not going to be proceeding with further funding for CodeMonkey. And that was a difficult decision, especially when our CEO came along and, um, and said, you know, have thirty seven and a half thousand dollars of my money. And just to kind of show his passion for this whole project, I had to email him and say, look, Tom, um, we've decided 
we're not going to go ahead with the funding. And then he emailed me back and he says, Matt, just um, OK, tell me who I've got to write the check to and I'll uh, I'll get it sorted. And then I had to email the CEO back and and correct my CEO and said, ah, sorry, Tom, you've made a mistake. We're actually not proceeding. We're not asking for your money. And that was it kind of back to the whole premise of saying, well, we treated this as if it was our own money. And if you look at that May engagement figure, we haven't hit our 5,000. And we decided not to put the funding forward because we couldn't guarantee to benefit 5,000 students. And I thought, you know, how can I ask somebody to invest almost $40,000 without enabling a guarantee that uh, that those students are all going to actually benefit from the funding that we put forward. And so we, we made the difficult decision and uh, not to actually move forward with it. And so the uh, the partnership with CodeMonkey will actually terminate at the end of this uh, this academic year, which is a shame. Uh, there have also been some communication challenges, should we say, between uh, CodeMonkey and OneStream as we've gone through. But, you know, that's actually a sideline. The main reason for doing this whole project was to benefit 5,000 children. And we still hope that we're going to achieve that objective by the time we get to the end of this academic year. So what did we learn? <laughs> we learned a lot. <laughs> um, we learned that it's hard to create a proposal when nobody's had the idea before. So we had to um, put a framework of a document together. We had to figure out what we thought our uh, board of executives would want to hear. We had to highlight the features. Uh, we had to explain clearly what we were trying, what we were asking of the board, because everybody on that board, they are time poor. And for us to put down a, a thick uh, proposal for them to consume and digest just wasn't going to work. So we needed to find a way that this was going to enable them to quickly make a decision. So it was hard to create a proposal, a proposal when nobody's done it before. So we, you know, we lay the ground for hopefully future ideas. We also learned that you must respect that teachers have many calls on their time. And to be honest, we already had that respect. My mother was a teacher. Um, 15 years ago, I was working in schools, um, running business and enterprise workshops to promote STEM. So I know that teachers have already got far too many calls on their time. And the reason I wanted to put that point in as a learning point was because, you know, we're, we're trying to always encourage the teachers to to get the kids involved, to actively engage with the CodeMonkey platform. But in the same at the same time, we've got to respect that you've got a lot of other things going on in the curriculum. And the CodeMonkey project was nothing to do with your main curriculum. This was an extracurricular activity. And we also learned <laughs> you cannot force a child or a teacher to engage. So no, no matter how many times we went back to the schools and said, you know, could you could you please Go and have a look at the CodeMonkey platform. You've got this uh, this money here. It's paying for your access. Um, you know, make uh, make best use of it before it finishes. We just can't force you to do that. I can't force five thousand children to work on the CodeMonkey platform unless it gets um, put in as part of the curriculum. So we learned that. We also learned that we should celebrate success, even if we don't hit the target. There were so many things to celebrate about this. We celebrate the fact that we pulled a proposal together that we'd never done before. Celebrate the fact that we persuaded a board of a six billion dollar enterprise to give us thirty seven and a half thousand dollars for a project. We needed to celebrate that we've got CodeMonkey who was approaching the teachers, celebrate that we could try and benefit all of these underprivileged children, celebrate the fact that we're trying to encourage children to be aware of STEM and coding careers. So even though we didn't hit our 5000 target, there are so many reasons to walk away from this project and feel, yeah, we did a good job. And yeah, we certainly learned that we've got a very generous and supportive leadership. That is something about OneStream software. The culture for me is really special. Um, it's all about um, encouraging each other to be successful, backing each other up, supporting everybody along the way. And it's, I mean, I, like I said, I've worked with OneStream for four years now, and that culture comes directly from the CEO and feeds down to absolutely everybody. We operate on a basis of servant leadership. 
you know, I, I actually, uh, Luigi introduced me as a lead technical education consultant. I'm actually now a manager of a team of technical education consultants, and I operate on that basis of servant leadership. I'm here to serve my team to make sure that they can do their best in the organization. And that whole approach has come right down from uh, from our CEO. So, yeah, we learned that we've got a, a very generous and supportive leadership. And then the final thing that we learned is that deciding when to stop is hard. We must have considered the decision for about a month on what we were going to do about this extra money that our CEO and other executives had offered to us. In the end, it was almost $50,000 that was on the table for us to put back into, uh, into CodeMonkey, but we just couldn't guarantee to benefit the students. So we're, uh, we're having to figure out another way. But deciding when to stop was really hard. So that for me is my story of classroom to career. Um, what I hope in a perfect world is that at some point, while I'm still working for OneStream, there will be somebody who joins our organization and said, well, I engaged with CodeMonkey about 10 years ago. And I know that it was funded by OneStream and I was so inspired by that, I thought I would apply for a job with OneStream software. That would be <laughs> a brilliant, icing on the cake for me. I would love to hear that happen. If anybody decides to apply for a career with OneStream in the future, just talking about any engagement with CodeMonkey that was funded by OneStream, I'd be extremely excited. So that is my, um, my story of classroom to hopefully career. And so now we're opening up to questions. Thank you, thank you, Matt. That was very interesting um and uh before actually going to question i just want for the last time to remind um our um, uh, participants to sign the signature list if um here um so they can receive the certificate of participation going for the questions actually mm, so i would like to start from the end uh, of your presentation and ask you so if the uh, project with code monkey with the initiative with code monkey is going to an end in july do you have uh, looking ahead do you have any um, uh, other initiative plan for the future in coding what's um where is one string moving um in in this area you know, Luigi, say, um, we do not um i it's been a bit of a busy year for me uh, like i said a moment ago i'm now managing a team of technical education consultants and that's taken up a lot of my time so we haven't actually had the chance to look at another place where we could spend uh, the money that our ceo is going to generously offer but um, I'll keep it in mind. It's still of interest to me. I still to go and um, engage in STEM activities with universities and schools. So coding is still there at the back of my mind. I suppose, I suppose I'm just waiting for the right opportunity to come across my desk that makes me feel impassioned enough to want to pursue it. OK, great. And um, still um, recalling uh, one other thing that you said, so that it was the first time working um, for the age group um, um, under 14 years old. Yeah. So what would you um, reckon has been the, 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 the greatest challenge uh, in this regard, uh, working with this age group? Wow. Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a good question. And of course, I'm saying that to try and give myself time to think of an answer. Um, one one of the original objectives with this project was uh, we thought that OneStream employees might have had the opportunity to go and engage with some of the schools that were benefiting from the funding, you know, physically go along to those schools and talk to the kids and find out what they thought of it and, you know, spread the good word about OneStream software. Um, unfortunately, as it turned out, uh, because of privacy guidelines and GDPR, as we know in Europe, that made it. We, we couldn't do it. We couldn't get into the schools. Um, and I found that a bit of a challenge because I was just, all we wanted to do 
was to go and find out how much the kids were enjoying engaging with the CodeMonkey platform to see them enjoying the um, the funding. Uh, Lindita says, oh, students love it. Uh, that well, well, that would have been fantastic to see. <laughs> <laughs> so that was probably the biggest challenge, trying to uh, trying to get in there and, and experience firsthand what was going on. And um, on teacher side, did you have uh, did you have difficulties in trying to uh, engage teacher uh, in, um, in in this initiative, uh, or they were um, uh, happy to the teachers to learn this? Yeah, as you <laughs> would expect. I mean, um, Code Monkey actually did all of the engagement with the schools and the teachers. Again, because of GDPR, we were unable to uh, proactively contact them ourselves. Um, but the feedback, I mean, when we had these monthly meetings with Code Monkey to find out about how the numbers were going, they would always give us the feedback as to how they've been contacting the schools and um, how great the teachers were with engaging. So there was never any negative feedback from Code Monkey about the teacher engagement. I mean, which teacher out there is going to turn down, first of all, free funding for a resource, and secondly, another opportunity to do something different with their students? Yeah, that's true. That's true, even because um, as someone was saying before in chat, um, they try to recommend Code Monkey to the, in their school, mm. but um, of course they needed a, um, a license for it to use and it was uh, it was not approved so yeah. that's uh, that's something for sure and let's see what they say in the chat yeah they're all very excited about code monkey it is i mean it's, so. it's, it's a great platform um there was another guy that i was working with from one stream uh, he was getting his kids into the code monkey platform playing around with him uh, as well so um, I mean, my kids are a little bit too old to be playing on Code Monkey now. They're well and truly out of that five to fourteen age bracket. Um, but his kids were engaging with it, and they thought it was fantastic. And do you think gamification is an ex excellent way to engage students? Exactly. That's it is. Uh, what uh, I, what I, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's something that that we're using in the training content that we create. I mean, the OneStream software, it's technical financial software. And it's not a particularly easy product to learn. The topic could be thought of as quite dry. So me and my team, we've got to find ways uh, to create engaging training material to get people on board. And we are using gamification because people respond to that. They respond to um, hands on experiences when they can try the software for themselves, where they can make mistakes for themselves and figure out what the solution is. Um, it's very much hands on with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I completely agree. Gamification is the way to go. Yes, yes Marian, and, you're right. And um, so gamification is um, uh, is still in part very new to to the education system. So, it seems um, to have been. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly in the last five years, I've seen that it's more prominent in in training, not just in schools, but also in in the commercial environments as well. Um, why it's taken so long for people to say that they enjoy playing games? I don't know, but <laughs> it's certainly more popular. I, I think, and that's uh, actually the question, because um, schools are very um, used to, um, uh, let's say, have the classical uh, and traditional um, way of teaching. So, I agree. how is it? Do you think, and uh, based on uh, on on this initiative, is it hard to implement um, this kind of new um, way of new teaching approach. in the in in the traditional classroom? It takes a lot of creativity, Luigi. I'll, I'll certainly say that. Um, historically, the training courses that we've run have followed the format of delivering a PowerPoint slide and then going through a demonstration and then giving people the chance to go and practice in the software themselves. Uh, in fact, I was sitting on a course this week that was going through that exact process. But to turn that around and make your training more engaging, it does take a lot of creativity. It, it takes a very different skill set. Um, I find it hard to recruit the right people for my team that have got that experience, that knowledge of the right software to incorporate gamification, to incorporate interactive um, 
quiz questions to enable people to practice in an environment on their own um anything to make it more hands-on it it takes longer to produce that kind of material as well so it's again another reason why you need to have um you need to have people on your team with the right skill set to enable you to get that material out into the market quicker um but it yeah it does take longer it takes a different skill set but it certainly makes it more exciting um we um, actually have a question but i don't know if uh, matt you you want to to answer this because uh, we've been asked if uh, it's better code monkey or code.org oh um, i saw that comment <laughs> um i don't know the answer to that question because i've never actually looked at code.org so i couldn't tell you i'm afraid um and um yes you you will have the slides once we will publish them on our uh, website stem alliance website um so uh no um one other thing i i, I wanted to say was um um one other um perk of uh, i think gamification in this case uh, code monkey is that uh, it makes um it make people it makes not stem minded students uh, approach a stem uh, subject is mm -hmm. it uh, do you think that's like this initiative showed like uh, an engagement yeah okay. i mean what i would hope has happened is that students who are interested in stem topics have tried code monkey and then i'm hoping that a friend of theirs who isn't interested in stem topics will be standing on their shoulder and watching what's going on and then thinking oh that actually looks quite cool i might have a go at that one so it's, it's passive engagement i would hope that a lot of that has occurred so again even though our monthly figures from code monkey show that we haven't achieved our 5000 i would hope that extra 1300 has perhaps come from those who are sitting on the shoulder of the students who were engaging <laughs> great and um, one other thing regarding since this initiative was uh, focused on um, uh, inclusivity and mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to reach uh, underprivileged uh, students. So um, you said that it was uh, Code Monkey to to find the um, the school district to to. And so, do you have any? Oh, Luigi, I've lost your audio. Yeah, we've lost your audio, Luigi, but I'm assuming that my audio is still working. And I think your question was probably something along the lines of how did the uh, CodeMonkey team engage and understand which uh, which districts to apply for or to work with? And they've just um, done a, a lot of research to understand um, w where the socioeconomic backgrounds were affected. So, for example, in the UK, the number of students that were getting their school lunches paid for by the government, then that is an indication that it's a, a, a low socioeconomic area. If there's a high number of children at that school that are getting their school lunches paid for. Um, so they had all of that data and they used that to uh, to figure out which districts and schools to approach. Um, sorry, I think uh, probably um, you missed me. You missed my audio for a couple I of did. seconds. <laughs> and uh, no, I just said that. Like, do you um, do you have any feedback on how it helped inclusivity and uh, diversity um, you know subjects? What? That's the only this? data that I don't have, and it's such a shame because this all was driven from diversity, equity, and inclusion objective. But no, I, I don't know how many um diverse backgrounds we engaged i don't know what proportion of um of different cultural backgrounds were engaging with one stream and honestly i'm not actually interested in that i'm interested in just benefiting for uh, the underprivileged kids from whatever background they're in um that's true so yeah the important thing in this, uh, is that um he was the, the initiative was efficient um we've been asked have you considered working in Africa, um, I, I believe it says like focus the project in uh, in Africa uh, educational system. We 
uh, have not is the short answer. Um, but right at the start of the presentation, I talked about how we chose the areas that we wanted to focus on. We had we had this one pot of money. Um, we chose three areas, Detroit, Atlanta and Manchester in the UK, um, because at some point we had to decide where we were going to focus on. Um, and, you know, we couldn't kind of say, well, here's fifteen dollars for a school in South Africa and here's fifteen dollars for a school in Mexico and do it that way, because that just wasn't cost effective for the Code Monkey team to work with. They needed to kind of apportion uh, a sum of money with one district uh, of schools and then and then work, um, you know, get their teams to work with them. Uh, and no, and no, we haven't started working in Pakistan yet, unfortunately. They, they'll get there one day. Well, we will in time. <laughs> we we have offices in uh, in South Africa, um, not the the rest of Africa, but we're we're slowly getting a larger global presence. And I would hope that the one streamers there are, are also going to um, promote STEM topics too. Okay, so if there are not any other question, I think we've come to the closing. So um, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure being um, uh, your host tonight. And many thanks for your contribution. It was super interesting. And I think uh, the comments from uh, the teacher in the chat um, showed that. So thank you all and goodbye and uh, have a, a nice evening. Thanks again. Bye bye.